All right, all right, all right. Don't take it personally, they're always like this when I'm on stage. So, I want to... Who's, uh, who's, um, who's doing the smoking then? Who's doing the smoking? Don't worry, I reckon that if we don't draw attention to it, we'll skip the fine. Does that mean Matt Rack's not here to check the fire, <laughs> fire stuff? So, mate, it's a bit warm in here. Do you not want to take off your jacket? The man's, the man's not hot. <laughs> oh, my G. My G. So, I want to be a bit sincere for a second. A little bit sincere. So, since you've become Labour leader, there has been this mood of elation and hope. I was walking around, um, you know, by Camden Town Hall. And I was just thinking about how much better life is going to be under a Labour government. And then, yeah. It's, it's going to be like this, but all the time. And then this guy, who was kind of cute, came up to me and was like, so, uh, why are you smiling, darling? You thinking about me? And I had to be honest and be like, no, I was thinking about Jeremy Corbyn becoming <laughs> Prime Minister. Sounds and like a conversation killer. <laughs> Yeah, no, he sort of looked at me and was like, second thoughts. So the country's gone through a bit of a dark time. Things are getting better. And you know who else has been going through a bit of a dark time? Your beloved Arsenal FC. Oh. But, and it pains me to do this as a rabid Spurs fan. What? A rabid what's Spurs go, fan. What's going on here? To announce Arsenal's new star signing... Thank you. Shall we honour it to Hector Bellerin? Because he, he saw off Piers Morgan, didn't he? <laughs> um, we're going to hand over to you to tell us a bit about your visions for not just the future of Britain, but next season as well. Maybe tell us how you've been enjoying your Thursday nights recently. Well, the, the, um, you know, the bus journey to Belarus is long and slow. But... Um, the journey's going to be worth it in the end. And uh, we're quite lucky that um, no team in Vladivostok is playing in the Europa League. It would be an awfully long journey for a Thursday night. But you know what? After the cup final, do you remember that? And you know something? I mean, you'll love this as a Spurs supporter. I don't want to be difficult about oh this, but can you think of it this way? Who's won more matches at Wembley this year? <laughs> Arsenal or Spurs? <laughs> Listen, I'm not about, I am not about to be the future Prime Minister on stage, but if afterwards I'll take my earrings out, someone can hold my bag, we'll settle this the old-fashioned way. I've got a nice little box you can put your earrings in, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I remember uh, I bumped into you on the tube wait, a year can, can ago. I, can I say something about yeah. Arsenal? It's, you'll Oof. like this bit, actually. You'll, you'll like this bit, actually, because this is inclusive. This is the caring, sharing, lovely Arsenal that you know and love, really. After the cup final, you remember that. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I'm very sure that the majority of this audience are not Arsenal supporters, so you've got to be quite careful here. Don't worry, I'm, used to, I'm very used to being in a minority. <laughs> that um, I came out of the cup final and I was stopped. They said, OK, Corbyn. Your lot's going to get smashed in the election. You're going to get trounced. Your party's going to be finished. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I said, um, do you know what? The underdog in red is more dogged than you ever thought. Watch this space. Yeah, mate, I've got, I've got nothing. I've got nothing compared to that. Mm? I've got nothing compared to that. Oh, I don't no. have any good political analogues with Spurs. All I have is an agonising <laughs> and toxic 25-year relationship, really. It's brutal. We can help you out. <laughs> <laughs> we're a caring party and organisation. The kind, we the gentler, We're very kind, very gentle. We'll help you out. No problem at all. 
So I think these lovely people are waiting for you to give one of your characteristic barnstorming speeches, Jez. Can I um, first of all say it's a wonderful tradition in the Labour Party. You try to um, reduce the levels of joy. So you organise a party to end conference and you start it off with a speech. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to get better later on. Thanks. Uh, who's, who said that? Who said that? Oh, very good. The droll man over there with the yellow tie on. Thank you. I think the, the way in which in the second year running we've had the World Transformed event as an event parallel to and involved and part of the atmosphere of our conference is absolutely fantastic because you've provided the space, the verve, the inspiration and above all the opportunity for people to come here and share their views, share their visions, share their ideas, ask difficult and searching questions and continue to inspire and debate because that is really what politics is all about. And next year in Liverpool, obviously I don't know what the venue is going to be, but let's make the world transformed absolutely an essential part of the whole conference spirit because that is what it is about. So I want to say thank you to all of you for what you've done over the world transformed. And I'm very proud, very proud to have been able to come here and support the World Transformed. And I, I know you've had uh, Naomi Klein here speaking to you, and I was very pleased when she accepted the invitation that we sent her to ask her to speak to party conference, because I've admired what she's written and done for a very long time, and I had the pleasure of doing a big event at the Paris Climate Change Conference with Barry Gardner, and we had um, a very big meeting one evening discussing issues not just of the very serious questions about climate change and um, global warming and the obvious effects of all of that, but a much more profound discussion as well about attitudes to the environment, about pollution, of damage to water quality, air quality, reforestation, and all those issues, about the mindset of how you deal with the environment. Now, Naomi has written extensively on all this and then taken it into a challenge on speculative economics which leads to rust belt towns, left behind communities, unbelievable levels of poverty, a sense of hopelessness and a fertile feeding ground for those that would exploit that hopelessness to blame somebody else and pander to racism and let racism grow as a result of it. Surely we can do a lot better. So I think the very profound questions that she put in a speech to conference today are something that is educative of all. And I want to thank her for that. And also thank Tom Watson for what he also said about the gig economy and automation within our society, because we have to deal with and confront these issues. If you think about it, previous industrial revolutions the first ones that um, developed steam power, that led to industrialization, that led to the manufacture of steel, were huge and profound, and led to a mass exodus from rural communities in Britain into the urban centers, and led to also the Enclosure Acts, which took away the ability of rural communities to sustain themselves and force tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of workers into industrial slums. That led to, eventually, a profound political change. But to begin with, it wasn't a profound political change. It was a sense of desperation and hopelessness. Later industrial changes and revolutions led to industrial warfare in the First World War and led after the First World War to electronics industry growing up, to a more high-tech industries growing up, which had, again, a parallel effect on older industrial areas. And so the process has gone on. At every stage of those revolutions, immediately the very richest were made very rich, the very poorest suffered the most, and the most oppressive governments took over to deal with the issues of what the poorest were putting up with. Oppression of trade unions, oppression of human rights, and uh, 
appalling treatment of the very poorest. And so we now move to a whole new revolution in terms of uh, very high technology, in terms of automation, and, and all those issues. Are we going to stand back and say that this new automation will create the multi, multi, multi billionaires of a small number of people who've got hold of the technology and can therefore control a lot of industry from that? Or are we going to be strong enough to say we want and will do something very different so that the benefits of technology shared amongst all rather than used as a wealth and power grab for the very few? These are not... <laughs> these are not simple issues, but they're issues that have been raised. But it's also how we deal with that. And so I hope that uh, the policy discussions we'll be having by everybody reaching out, popular, public discussions, will lead to that profound change in thinking. Because when we look for an election, maybe next year, maybe the year after, I can't predict exactly when it will be. I've no idea what plans Theresa May has to walk in the Welsh hills. Um, <laughs> But uh, we have to have those debates and those discussions. And I look to the spirit of the world transformed and the work that Momentum and others are doing to make sure that we widen those discussions out. Everybody can make some contribution to it. And the more they're involved in thinking about what we do for the future, the stronger we will be and the more determined we'll be to win that election whenever it comes, and the better prepared we'll be for going into government after that. Two other things I want to say is this, that um, our society, our people, are actually incredibly creative. People all over the world are incredibly creative. Music, song, dance, theater, art, all that is very, very creative. I think too often, we're almost apologetic, ashamed of the idea we're a bit creative, and we oft, too often suppress it in children and young people and don't give them that chance. And I think one of the most important things we can do is um, improve our education system so that we don't uh, drive the creativity out of young people. We positively welcome it and encourage it. <laughs> Hence... Hence my views, hence uh, the views we all have on, on music, art and theatre education. So it's there for all of us and for the many. And it doesn't actually have to be exclusive. It can be there at all times and uh, helps children feel included in their communities, included in their lives and what they're going to do. But also understand the way in which um, everyone is creative in many ways all through their lives, even in the worst of circumstances. Somebody that I'm very fond of and a great admirer of is the writer Ben Okri. He has had a difficult and very complicated life, and for some time he was homeless, but he was still writing when he was homeless. He'd be sleeping rough and then going into a library and writing during the day. And so he had this thirst to put down on paper what his ideas and his experience were. And you look at so many writers that have achieved so much in that sense. So think of all those stories of refugees that are not being written down. Those people that are going through the most horrendous times in their lives in refugee camps around the world and suffering as a result. So. I was very pleased a couple of days ago to be given a book of um, refugee stories and refugee poetry. Fascinating, amazing stuff. They're human beings just like all of us and they want to contribute to the good of all of us. And so it's up to us practically to reach out, practically to help and support people. And last Saturday, I met um, a young man in a um, local facility around here. And he said, you remember me, don't you? And I said, yeah. Really, really sorry, not sure. He said, you know what? You last saw me in Calais in the refugee camp two years ago. And he's now here contributing to our society and our community. Well done, him. And so 
it is about that, and it is about our attitude towards the rest of the world, the way we, which we deal with the environmental and refugee crises, the way in which we work for and look for a world of peace, in which we look for the causes of war, the causes of instability, and the dangers that those unstable places bring about for the rest of us, which is why I said what I said during the election campaign about all that, and I will continue in that direction and keep on saying that, because we do need to have a different approach to the whole world. There's only one planet that I know of that's got anybody living on, so let's look after it. And this conference has been a, a, an incredible experience because it's the biggest Labour Party conference that's ever been in my lifetime, as I said the other day. And uh, I've been to pretty well every Labour Party conference since before 1970, so I've got a good lot to compare it to. And it's been one of the most inclusive and one of the most respectful of each other that I can remember for a very long time. And that, and that is how it must be. If we believe in socialism, if we believe in the goodness of all human beings to do things for each other, then we have to set an example of how we treat each other as well. How we relate to each other, how we respect each other, particularly when you don't agree with each other. Because from that, it doesn't show weakness, that is strength. And then uh, I've got quite a lot of places I've got to go to this evening, and I've got a little job on tomorrow, which I've got to get ready for. Um, uh, I just want to conclude with this. I was doing a number of um, interviews today, and uh, they said to me, what would be your first priority with the Labour government? And there's obviously lots and lots of things that, are the immediate priority of announcements you'd make, decisions you'd take, and so on. But they, I said to them as this, I said, there's something that is profoundly wrong, the housing in this country. That too many people are living insecure lives in private rented accommodation, high rents, short tenancies, and children growing up not knowing where their home's going to be next month, next week, or even sometimes the next day. All they know is they're going to be evicted and they've got to present themselves at the housing department and find which other flat they're going to be sent to for another six months. Imagine what that does to those children and their perceptions of community and life and security. And so, as far as I'm concerned, our priority, there are many, but the first priority has to be saying we will set in train a process, as was done in the debate today, on housing, on housing security, and housing investment. That will mean, yes, spending money on housing. Yes, it will mean spending money employing people to build those houses. Yes, it will mean spending money on employing people to provide the services for those houses. And in building good quality houses at proper, secure, affordable rents, you're building strong communities at the same time. And so we also look at cooperative housing. And then I said the priority, and John, and John McDonnell explained this very well in his speech to conference, that what we want to do is measure the success of us, of our government, by our inclusion of everybody in what we do while, as a party, but also in government what we do to lower inequality, increase opportunity for the poorest and most marginal, and ensure a sense of fairness across the country. So coalfield communities where the pits were closed under Thatcher will get the investment they need and deserve. <laughs> that whole swathes, whole swathes of the country will not be left behind as they have been in this unfair race which has left so many communities with high levels of unemployment, low, low quality, low paid jobs. It's simply wrong. And so it is what we do. So we campaign, so we talk, so we debate, so above all we take out that message there of what we can achieve and how that other world could be achieved and is very, very possible. I want to thank Momentum for what they've done. I want to thank the World Transform for being here and what it's achieved. And 
so many people have said to me how they have come along to the world transformed. They didn't really know what it was. They were slightly skeptical about it. I've no idea why, but they might have read something about it in the papers. Uh, who knows? And they've come along and said how interesting it was, how welcome they were made to feel, and how much they learnt from being here. Everybody we meet knows something else, knows something we don't know. People have different ideas and different concepts. Don't dismiss them, listen to them, learn from them, and that makes us all stronger at the end of it. What we're doing is building a movement, a movement of hope, of opportunity, a movement of determination, a movement that recognizes we cannot go on headlong into greater inequality, greater injustice, greater poverty, and at the extreme end of that, more and more homelessness. Or we can go in the other direction of doing things differently and better. And you know what? We will. Thank you very much.